Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's very nice to see so many of you. Thanks for coming to our talk. I know it's right after lunch and very interesting BOF sessions are going on. So we'll try to make this even more interesting. Yeah. Forgot my clicker. So hello, everyone. My name is Laszlo. I'm a founding engineer at Enchflow. We build a remote execution and remote caching service for Bazel and other build systems. Before joining Enchflow, I used to work at Google in this office. Between 2010 and 20, I was a part of the Bazel team, as you can see from most of my clothing. And initially, I worked on internal JavaScript rules and tooling. I was a JavaScript imposter like Alex. I didn't write any JavaScript, just the tooling. But after we open sourced Bazel in 2015, my focus has shifted to Windows, to bringing Bazel to the Windows users. For a few years, I was the tech lead on this project. And today, I want to tell you about some of the most interesting challenges that we've come across while porting this Linux-only software to Windows. Since you're at this conference, I assume most of you have used Bazel. And since you're at this talk, I guess some of you may have even used Bazel on Windows. But if you had to guess the percentage of people in this room among us who have used Bazel on Windows, what would be your guess? Now, please don't say anything. Just think about a percentage. Okay, could you please put up your hand if you think at least 10% of us in this room or more have used Bazel on Windows? OK, that's, that's a lot, about a third of you. 25% or more? OK, still see some hands. 50% or more? OK, excellent. Now, please put up your hand if you have used Bazel on Windows. <laughs> OK, so most of you have, and most of you thought that you haven't. So I think that's very entertaining. Uh, but the other reason I asked you this, uh, other than being cheeky, is the Bazel team faced a similar question back in 2015. We just open sourced Bazel. It was running on Linux. We all used Linux. Everyone at Google was using Linux for the most part. We knew Windows was important, but didn't really know how important. So we took a, took a look around outside of Google and discovered that the most popular OS was actually Windows 7. So we had to support Windows if we were serious. Beside Bazel happening in 2015, another important thing happened, and that was TensorFlow. TensorFlow was massively popular. It built with Bazel and CMake. And we thought that a lot of developers will want to build this on their computers, from professionals to hobbyists to students. And a lot of them would be using Windows, preferably building with Bazel. A lot of them would be using Windows, and many of them would not be on their own computers. They would not have administrator rights. So we set two restrictions for ourselves. We wanted to support Windows 7, and we want it to not require administrator rights, either to install Bazel or to run it. So yeah, no big deal. Can't be that hard. We don't need root access on Linux. Why would we need it on Windows? And as for other how hard can it be type of questions, we thought, yeah, we need to deal with Bash. Bazel depends on that. I'll get to that in a second. But Bazel itself is mostly Java. Compile once, run everywhere, right? There's a bit of C++, but we'll figure. Let's start with Bash and C++. Bazel depends on Bash with about a million tentacles. Every gen rule is an arbitrary shell command. So we need Bash for that. PyBinary, Java binary, PyTest, Java test, a bunch of other binary and test rules have something called stub scripts. And these are things that find your interpreter or JVM, compile your class path, and set environment variables before it can run your actual program. Those are all written in shell scripts. Test wrappers, every test rule has a shell script that sets up the environment for it before the test can be run. So those are all written in shell. We needed something for Bazel, uh, for Bazel on Windows. And as for the POSIX API, the C++ part of Bazel is um, heavily dependent on some of the, the POSIX functions that Windows doesn't implement. So we needed, in order to even compile Bazel, we needed those functions. And the solution was something called MSYS. MSYS is a bash terminal, a bash build for Bazel. 
it can run bash scripts natively. So it solves that problem. It also gives us many of the GNU bin utils like sed and grep and awk that generals take for granted and um, has a package manager so you can install more. But most importantly, it has a library that you can link your programs against. And it implements just enough of the POSIX API on top of the Windows API that we could build Bazel against it. So that was great. Now, back to the previous restriction. Not being able to use administrator rights meant one thing, that, but that was really painful. And that is, we could not create symlinks. And not because the file system doesn't support them, because MTFS does. The problem is, under Windows 7, you can only create, a program can only create symbolic links if it's running as administrator. And we didn't want to do that. And if you don't know, a symlink is just a special file on disk which points to another file or directory or another path. Whatever is under that path points to that. And Bazel uses this heavily because if you have an action with lots of input files that you need to arrange in a certain way, you can either copy them to the right places or you can create pointers to them, which is a lot faster. And that's what Bazel does. So we wanted something like that on Windows, but couldn't use symlinks. So what else is there? Turns out there's a thing called junctions. These are like directory symlinks. They only exist on Windows, but they serve uh, our, our purpose as well. You don't need administrator rights to create them, and they are super fast. But what about files? We can consider hard links. Hard links are also special files. I'm going to hand wave about this, so I'm sorry if you know how file systems work. This is going to be imprecise. But hard links are special files that also just point to other files. Uh, the two key differences with symlinks is they point to a concrete file object on disk, uh, which is going to be important in a second. And the other thing is they can only point to files, not directories. But they are also fast to create. They don't need administrator rights, so they can be used for our purposes. But not so fast, because they are named this way for a reason. Uh, if you modify a hard link, if you modify a file that a hard link points to, you see the modifications through the link. But if you delete the file and recreate it, then the link still points to the old content. And that's important because if you stage your input tree with hard links and Bazel rebuilds one of your input files, then it also needs to recreate the link, which is a problem if you have thousands of actions and thousands of input files because it slows you down. So they can become stale in this regard. Uh, and the other problem is their target needs to be writable in order to create a hard link. I believe this is true on Linux as well, but on Linux we are using symlinks. Uh, and what this means is, if your actions have input files, uh, they are staged with hard links that point into your source tree, and those are writable, and your action modifies them. Well, that's bad news for your downstream actions. So what did we do? We used hard links anyway. <laughs> uh, moving on to more differences between Linux and Windows that we had to solve. File system is notably, uh, I think, well known that it's very different. The path separators are different. There are no, uh, there's no single root to your file system. There are multiple routes. These are the drives that you're familiar with, C colon, D colon. Uh, the path, paths are case insensitive. So the two paths you see on the screen, left-hand side, right-hand side, they are equal on Windows. On Linux, they would be different. And imagine these have built files. Are these packages then equal? And the answer is yes, on Windows they are. Actually, on macOS they are as well. And this is still a bug today. Path length limitations are different. On Linux, it's about 4,000 characters. On Windows, traditionally, only 260. Uh, Microsoft, back in, I believe, Windows 98 or so, started adding new API functions to support longer paths, up to about 32,000 characters. But those are new API functions. So it's a compile time decision which one you use. And you're, if Bazel is trying to run actions that were built with the shorter limit, you're screwed. And finally, paths can take many different forms. All the paths you see here are basically the same path. Now, there's nuance here. I'm not going to get into what are the numbers after the tilde and all of that. But if you have worked with Windows, you will, you will recognize some of these. And the final difference I want to discuss is in process management. On Linux, if you want to start a subprocess, you're calling the execve function and you're passing an argument, uh, an argument vector to your child process. And if, you're, if your arguments contain spaces or special characters, you know the child process is going to receive them as you have, as you have intended. But on Windows, when you create a subprocess, 
you're passing the entire command line. And it's up to the child process to tokenize that into an argument vector. And if Bazel uses one quoting mechanism and the child process uses another one, bad luck. And finally, there is no shebang mechanism on Windows. So if you can imagine on Linux, you have a Starlark rule whose executable is a, is a Python script. The Python script has the X bit and has a shebang line saying, where's my interpreter? But on Windows, you cannot have this. I believe the Node.js rules uh, are where I have seen this, that they needed to be ported to Windows so that they run an exe file rather than a script. OK, so these were the high-level problems that we have come across. In 2015, with open source Bazel, it had Linux support. And just a year later, March 2016, we were able to announce experimental Windows support, which means we've solved most of these problems to some extent. And we were able to make it experimental. Half a year later, we had support for the major languages. And the year later after that, in 2017, we were able to cut some of the ties to MSIS. This I forgot to mention earlier, but from the start, from the get-go, we wanted to reduce Bazel's bash dependency as much as we could, because bash isn't really native on Windows. But for the reasons I explained earlier, we could not. Uh, in 2017, we could finally not link Bazel itself to MSYS. So you still needed MSYS if you had general or other bash requiring things, but not for Bazel itself. We now had a native run, a, a native wrapper for the C++ toolchain. Previously, we had wrapper scripts that translated the GCC arguments to MSVC. This meant C++ compilation was faster. We created half as many processes. We were able to build Android apps, and we had native stub script, not stub scripts, but stub for the binary rules. In 2018, three important things happened. Remote execution was really taking off for TensorFlow. Uh, we had the Google Summer of Code. Google Summer of Code is a summer program by Google for students and open source projects, where students can contribute to open source projects, and Google, Google pays them a stipend for doing so. Bazel was part of this. We had an excellent contributor named Lu Rongji who implemented sandboxing for Windows. I think this is a little known fact, but Bazel still supports sandboxing on Windows today. You can still find his uh, comments on GitHub. And even the last time I tried, uh, the code was slightly broken, but it could be revived. Everything is still on GitHub. And finally, um, we had we finally implemented run files tree support using Simlinks. Starting with Windows 10, you could opt in to creating Simlinks without administrator rights. And for those people who did, we wanted to have support for that. And if you have watched uh, Fabian's talk last year, you will know that on Windows, we were not creating Simlinks for run files tree. We created manifest files that just describe the tree. And that gets me to Bazel 1.0 in 2019, when we have got even more ties to Bash, even the test wrapper was now native. We had native support for uh, batch scripts and PowerShell scripts in general. We had all the rainbows and unicorns you wanted. And this ends my section of the talk. So this is the history. So now I want to hand it over to Jay, who will tell you about the future. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to part two of our talk. I'll be telling the story of how we made remote execution work at Edgeflow on Windows workers. Um, so this, this is really new. We're just starting to get off the ground with this. Um, but I hope it's going to be more widely used soon. Uh, remote execution adds a ton of value uh, for Bazel users. And there are a lot of Windows developers out there, some of whom are using Bazel already, uh, many of whom, actually, we just learned, um, many not yet. So I also hope that this unlocks a lot of uh, Bazel adoption, too, in the future. Let's see. Here we go. Um, so a little bit about me before we go on. Uh, like Laszlo, I'm a software engineer at Engflow. I joined uh, a little over a year ago. Previously, I worked at Google on the Go team, where I led development of Rules Go and Gazelle. Uh, I also worked on the, the Go tool that's Go's build system. Uh, did a bunch of things there. Um, a fair amount of Windows low-level cross-platform -plat development. So that led me to doing Windows stuff at Engflow. Um, 
I, I do consider myself a Windows imposter. Uh, I, I think we're all imposters in something. And um, th this is an area that I'm not super familiar with. I stopped using Windows personally in the early 2000s. C++, it was easier to get started on Linux. Um, so a lot of things have changed while I wasn't paying attention. And uh, I don't know, maybe being a beginner, like beginner's mindset, this talk will be um, more approachable. Um, so I had a slide about how remote execution works. I think you've seen similar slides in like three or four other talks. <laughs> so we, we can kind of skip on here. Um, th this is Enflow's flavor of it. Uh, the thing that I wanted to point out here is that we can have different pools of workers and different configurations. They can run different operating systems. So the new thing that we're doing here is Windows workers, just that, that box at the bottom. Um, so fortunately, we didn't have to start from scratch for that. Uh, our worker service, that is the big bit of code that receives execute requests and runs commands uh, on Windows. Um, so the worker service is written in Java. Um, that largely lives up to its promise of write once, run anywhere. Uh, we have a fair amount of Java and C++ code that's inherited from Bazel itself for uh, running actions on the worker, uh, running commands, file system operations. And so thanks to the hard work of uh, the Bazel team and the open source community for that. Uh, we do have a long list of problems to solve with our service, though. And uh, of course, there are going to be bugs to fix. So uh, let's start with v0. It's our first iteration of Windows support. Um, in this version, the workers can uh, run commands just directly on the host machine. Uh, and at this stage, we're mostly just figuring out how to operate uh, a scalable Windows service you know, with observability. Like r running a, a Windows Cloud service is, is kind, of, kind of different than what most of us do, right? Um, so I'm, I'm briefly going to cover some of the tools that we use. Um, first up is NSSM. Uh, we use this to run our, our services. It's a little bit analogous to systemd, although not quite. Uh, Windows does have its own built-in service management, um, but it, it's not as fully featured as systemd. So if you want to integrate with Windows' service management, you need to speak this low-level Windows messaging protocol that tells your program, like, hey, it's time to pause. Hey, it's time to restart. Um, and if you're writing code in Java, then it's very difficult to integrate with that. You generally need a wrapper process, and NSSM can uh, act as that wrapper. Uh, so it's, it's great for that. It also has a nice configuration tool, uh, so you don't have to edit the Windows registry directly. It handles log redirection, rotation, uh, automatic restarts, graceful shutdown, that kind of thing. So we like it for that. Uh, we use FluentBit for our log, uh, log processing, log filtering, log upload. Uh, we use that multi-platform. It was a bit of a challenge to get it to compile for Windows, but uh, once we get it running, it's been great. We use Windows Exporter for our Prometheus metrics, and we use uh, HashiCorp Packer to build our machine images. So uh, that's our toolkit for Windows. So v0 worked for simple things. It, it does have some pretty serious disadvantages, though. So we, we didn't end up shipping this to customers quite yet. Um, first up, there's no action isolation. So because actions are running directly in the host environment, uh, an errant action can you know, scribble over the cache accidentally. And there's also no way to limit uh, CPU or RAM usage. So you know, a very busy action can cause your other tests to time out. Things like that can interfere with concurrent actions on the same worker. Uh, the bigger problem, though, is a lack of Visual Studio build tools. So this is the Microsoft C++ tool chain. And basically, every customer wants to use this. So there's not much point in shipping something that can't have it. Um, the reason we, we couldn't ship it, these, this is a proprietary tool chain. So the Microsoft license is that you can install this, but we don't have permission to make it into a machine, machine image and redistribute it. Uh, theoretically, at least, you can install the toolchain in your Bazel workspace and configure it as a hermetic toolchain, where all of the toolchain files are inputs to every action. Um, that, that has a lot of overhead. There are a lot of files. Um, so we didn't really think that was practical. So on, on Linux, we solve these problems uh, with containers. Nearly all of our actions run in containers. And it's a little bit like a virtual machine. It's an environment separate from the host. It has its own file system, its own network. 
uh, you can set limits for CPU and RAM usage. Um, so that's just perfect for remote execution. And most of our, con our customers prepare container images that have all their tools baked in. Um, some of them are, are quite elaborate, so they don't need to be passed in as basal input. So that solves the Visual Studio problem too. Um, so it turns out while I wasn't paying attention, uh, Windows got containers. You can uh, download Docker from docker.com. It actually works on Windows. Um, so that's great. They, they've been there since Windows Server 2016. So new technology, we want to try it out and make sure it works. Um, so I prepared a container image that contains all our RCI stuff. And uh, we put this up on our example repo as a template that our customers can use. Um, so we started with one of the four base images that Microsoft provides. Nano Server is a very stripped down version of Windows. Um, this is good for apps that are built specifically for that environment. And it's missing a lot of things that you would expect. For example, if you install something, you have a graphical installer, you put it in text-only mode to script the installation. Um, it may not start because it is linked against a graphical DLL that is not in Nano Server, and so it will just give you a cryptic error code. Um, so we switched to Windows Server Core, and that has everything we need. It's a bit bigger. It's four gigabytes, um, but that's been working great. So we picked an image. Um, we installed our dependencies. The, um, so I, I'm going to get into a bit of a war story here. Um, we, install, we tried to install MSYS2. And I'm seeing like Docker build is just hanging. 100% uh, CPU indefinitely. So, so what's, what's going on? Um, I tried my very scientific debugging mode, which is adding lots of print statements everywhere. <laughs> um, and I find that the install script is succeeding. But it, Docker is not going on to the next step. So what, what's up with that? Um, so it turns out every, every, ins, every install step in Docker, it's firing up a new container. And those containers can write files into an overlay directory on the host. And those files eventually become part of your container image. Um, but not all of the files. Docker does a bit of cleanup in between steps, because you don't want to commit all of the garbage that happens to be in your temp directory. Um, and someone, fortunately before me, investigated this and figured out that msys2 was writing files with invalid Unicode characters in, in the name into like temp files. And this was tripping a bug inside the Go standard library's remove all function. <laughs> and so it was hanging. So the, this, this like fun interaction between like msys2 and Docker and Windows and Go, um, you know, our favorite kind of bug to investigate. Uh, so fortunately, the, there's a workaround. This is fixed in Go 1.21. Um, but we're, we're, we wait for a, a new build of Docker. In the meantime, we can remove all the files in the, temp in the temporary directory in the install script so Docker doesn't get tripped up by it. Um, so that's enjoyable. Uh, with our container build, we're, we're well on our way. Uh, the worker daemon already knows how to run Docker commands. Um, we needed to set up a few other things in the virtual machine. So we installed Docker D. We set up an NSSM service for it. Uh, we also installed credential helpers so that the machine automatically can log into Docker registries, like private registries that the worker is authorized to use. Uh, beyond this, a lot of the work has just been squashing bugs. And uh, I could get into the details here, but we'd need another day of conference. And I don't think you'd all stay around for that. Um, suffice to say, like all of the differences Laszlo talked about earlier are, are super relevant. And I was amazed to find this XKCD. There, there really is one for every situation. And uh, this is explaining how it is incredibly difficult to delete files on Windows. <laughs> Um, which a, a build worker needs to do kind of a lot. Um, so the, this, uh, this works now on the server side. There's a fair amount of configuration that needs to be done on the client if you're using a remote execution. Um, this is not really Windows specific, so I'm going to kind of cruise through this. Uh, you need a platform target that has a list of constraints saying you're running on Windows x86. Um, you can put your container image URL in here. Um, those are like in execution properties or a list of key value pairs passed to the server. Uh, second, you need a C++ tool chain configuration. And this is the hard part. Uh, Bazel generates this for you automatically for a local build. Um, however, if you're doing a remote build, you need to provide your own. One way to do that is to fire up a container locally, 
the same container image, uh, install Bazel, run a trivial C++ build, and extract that local configuration um, back into your host environment. And hey, it works remotely too. Um, so we have an example of that, and I wrote some documentation on our website. Uh, you can check out our example repo, uh, example repo for that. Uh, lastly, you just need to add some flags in your Bazel RC file telling Bazel that it needs to build remotely on the new platform. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, I think we have a few minutes left for questions. I do have one more story, but come find me afterward, and I'll tell it to you about uh, C++ header validation. <laughs> um, Leslo, do you want to come back up for questions? If we have any questions. Yeah. All right, we have time for questions. Yeah. Um, microphone is coming around. Wait a little bit more why you cannot uh, trigger remote executor on Windows from a um, Windows host. <laughs> um, theoretically, there's no reason it shouldn't be possible. It's, it's just bugs. Um, what, <laughs> what I've seen happen for C++ specifically is that Bazel thinks that a path beginning with like C colon slash is a relative path. And so it will put like a Linux absolute path in front of that. Um, like that can probably be fixed. Leslie, you, you might know more. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Use them both. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you could say a bit about the differences between the level of isolation provided by Docker containers on Windows versus what we would expect from, from Linux. Um, you, the, the main thing that we want from the isolation there is the, the file system isolation. And so that's very similar. You can bind mount directories across. Uh, I've run into a few bugs with that, which requires some workarounds, but it's still doable. In terms of like CPU and memory usage, like Docker on Windows gives you fewer controls, but you can still limit to like a specific number of cores and like specific memory. I, I haven't yet gotten into the network uh, network restrictions yet, so I, I can't say there. I, I think it's pretty similar, though. Um, you mentioned that there is a sandbox uh, for Windows um, available at some point. What is stopping that uh, from making it to, uh, to mainline? And the second question, is there um, any imposter here that already is confident enough to share his, uh, um, let's say, run files implementation in batch? I'm going to comment on the first one. <laughs> What's stopping us from using it? Uh, I think multiple things. The, you need to understand the entire ecosystem. You need to understand what a sandbox does. You need to understand Bazel itself. You need to understand how it works on Windows. I think it is absolutely doable. Uh, if I have some free weekends, I might even take a crack at it. I don't see any fundamental uh, blockers against it. Uh, partially, partially answer to this one, take a look in the aspect Bazel lib. We have a Windows um, helpers, which includes both a run file utility for batch with a T and also um, a handy wrapper so that you can, uh, you, can, you can create a batch file out of a bash file. And so then you can invoke it as an executable on Windows without having to build an exe, uh, which we've used for some of our rule sets. Um, so my question is uh, rule set authors and especially contributors often don't have a Windows computer and use that as their justification for why they can't make anything work on Windows, which is one of the things holding back Bazel from working better across Windows, as far as I can tell. I'm curious whether the, the things that you've done with the Dockerized uh, Windows environment would potentially provide a solution for this, where developers could have a Windows environment on a non-Windows computer? Um, I, I think you still need to have a Windows virtual machine somewhere. Um, there are a number of ways you can do that. Like you can run a virtual machine locally. You can run one in the cloud very easily. Um, like that, that's actually been great for development of this. Um, just like firing up a, an AWS instance or something. Um, I, if, if you're doing like remote execution onto Windows, I think like from a rule set author perspective, like you still kind of need a Windows host for that, at least for now. Yeah. All right. Thank you all.